Carol Plotkin, you've been with us before, right? I just, I'm sorry, I don't remember what movie you were chimed in on before. Carol and, okay. Carol and Jay have been with us a lot of times. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, I have a lot of names to remember. Jan Crucian, welcome. Good to see you. And Arla, um, you're new. Welcome. I hope you enjoyed tonight and I hope you enjoyed the movie. And uh, looks like we have a full house. We're at least 25. Esty, welcome back. Always good to have you. And Fern is going to moderate the way it works for the newcomers is that uh, raise your hand in the um, reactions and Fern will call on you in order of the way, uh, the time you raise your hands or wave. And we'll make sure everybody has a chance to talk at least once before we go back to people uh, participating for the second time. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say I just finished watching this movie minutes ago, and it was even better than I remembered it. It's just so terrifically put together. And, you know, I thought, well, it's a nice humanistic movie and there's not much Jewish relevance to it. There is so much Jewish relevance, which we'll get to. Maybe we'll uncover it on our on our own, but um, this is a really Hamish Menschlich kind of film about people recognizing each other and responding to their deepest emotional needs. And uh, uh, to me, that's Reform Judaism all the way. So uh, I'll, I'm going to let you guys chime in on it and tell me uh, what your overall reactions were. Let's not talk about too much about the details of the movie. I sort of laid out where I wanted to go, um, but there's a the conclusion is just fantastic. And uh, tell tell me how you first reacted to it. Did you like Martin in the beginning, or was he just a nasty cynic who'd been had his wings clipped by the BBC or the political environment of, of England? And did you think that Judy Dench was just this hick country uh, religious woman who wasn't really sophisticated at all in her? her thinking. Um, so we start out being very opposite in these two lead characters, yet something draws them together. So let me hear from you about those two characters. Anybody want to chime in on that? Doris. Oh my God. Yeah. It, the, the response is overwhelming. <laughs> Fern, you find I, somebody. I, 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 Doris. Doris. I like him from the beginning. I found him very, very, um, charming and very well as the show went on he became very attached obviously to her and she to him almost like he was a son that she'd been looking for in a way in a way um, right yeah. yeah i um i was very sad for her i felt i was trying to always try to put myself in the position of something something like that and uh her pain was so intense um and she was so mistreated by the Catholic Church, and she just kept on plugging along and plugging along. And she was her personality was was fabulous, wasn't it? I mean, she the way she talked and the way she she conducted herself, I thought she was sensational. Anyway, I liked the film. Um, it was sad, but it was it was it was an interesting film. And Doris, so you liked him from the beginning, even though he was a cynic and kind of nasty in a way he had an edge I wouldn't say nasty because he was always polite there's a kind of sardonic humor that he carries with him throughout the whole film but it doesn't drive you away does it no. it didn't drive you away nope did not um I felt there was going to be something there there was going to be a relationship there you know and uh he was going to uh either humor her, you might say, or help her. I'm not sure exactly what he had in mind in the beginning, but obviously the facts spoke for themselves as the show went on. Yeah, and I, I think um, it's somewhat clear. Let me refresh your memory in the beginning. He's cynical about human interest stories because he's a hardcore journalist mm -hmm. who happened to go to work for the British government and got burned because he said something and um, uh, there's that great scene at the cocktail party where he says, you know, you, you, uh, it's about shoveling shit for the, the bureaucracy for too long. And then suddenly you find your own shoes are dirty <laughs> and he couldn't take it any longer. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, that's very candid, but of course he says that to, you know, uh, fellow Republican, not, I mean, uh, American Republicans, but 
uh, fellow politicians and yeah. news people and, and uh, Sally, the, the newspaper, the human interest editor who manages to get drawn into the juicy story. So there's a lot of cynicism about the press in this film as well. Yeah. That we swallow, you know, without even questioning, oh, this is just natural for us today. This film was made in 2013. Huh. Guess who was president then? So it, it, it's like you can't blame cynicism on this film. It's just reality is, is what the, fi the film is responding to. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on, on British, uh, uh, the p British political climate in, in 2013 or 2012 when this was made, but. It, it's, it's clear that it's just it's it takes this big overview of what where our society is on both sides of the pond. I and, think uh, I'm sorry. I was gonna go say, ahead, Doris, please. What I think is interesting is you never know who you're going to uh, meet up with. I don't want to say hook up because it sounds like a romance, but it wasn't. But no, you just don't know where people are going to come right. together. And there was they were just an odd couple, you might say. Right. Right. And, uh, Let's come back to that later. And, and I'll, I'll make sure that you chime in, Doris, because I'm sure you have a lot to say about it. But this is one of the charming things about the movie. It's it's not a political movie. It's not a religious no. movie. It's a personal movie. And mm -hmm. you can't separate her from him and the changes he goes through in the course of the film from the changes she goes through, even though she's the, the lead player. You know, you think, oh, he's just there as a a conveyance or a, an expediter of her story. But he goes through a lot of changes as well. And I think that's where the Jewish component comes in. But let's save that for later. Does and, anybody- um, Yeah, Judy, Judy would like to say something. And after she does, I would like to say something. No, else. Fern, you can't. Well, I will. I've got, got, I've got the, the pointer. Well, first of all, Jim, <laughs> she's thank in you for recommending- Wait, 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 wait. I, Judy. I thought I had seen it, but I, I didn't apparently, and I loved it. And I did love both characters from the beginning. Um, maybe because I just like Steve Coogan that I couldn't ever be offended by him. But the thing that I kept thinking about, you just said it isn't a political movie. And I did take it as a political movie, especially right at this moment with the Supreme Court about to possibly overturn Roe v. Wade. And Amy Comey Barrett saying, well, you can just put the baby up for adoption if you don't want it. And this just, right. <laughs> this movie just showed how incredibly difficult that is and how painful. And um, so I, I actually thought it was an incredible, not only I think it was irrelevant, but I actually thought maybe that's why you picked it now. No, um, no, it, it wasn't that. It's a humanistic movie. And remember, yeah. this was made in 2013. No, I know. I know. There, there were plenty of, of anti-abortion uh, uh, advocates then. But my point is that, that could, could you mute us all, uh, uh, Hannah, because I, I can't, I don't know how you guys can hear me talk, but I can't stand hearing me talk. <laughs> Feedback. Um, it, it, it's like they were drawn to each other because of their sensitivity to each other and their, in, their intuitive insights into each other as human beings who feel things. And, and this is part of the reformed Judaism uh, hook for me. Maybe it's not for you. Um, so I don't think it's political by implication, not by design. I, I'm sure there was some design to it because of the sensibilities of the filmmakers uh, and, and the author. I mean, this is a real story based on a real woman and the author's uh, detailing of their relationship. One more thing. There was another movie on the same theme. I believe it was set, it was more recent, and it was set in some South American country. Um, and I can't think of the name. Oh, of uh, the Argentine movie. Yes, uh, yes. The woman wakes up and her baby is gone and they tell her oh, no. that it died, but actually they had sold it to an American. Very similar thing. Theme. And, you know, I guess this wasn't so uncommon in predominantly Catholic countries at that time. Well, it was 50 years ago, yeah. the 70s. More, and, 70 years. My, yeah. my whole, am I the one who's feeding us back? I think it may be. Judy, mute yourself and see what happens. It's Judy's. Uh, okay. Um, I think the 70s 
were as primitive, if not more so than the 60s, because they were reaction to the 60s. Despite all the progressive goodwill of young people in the 60s, of which I was one, um, uh, the world was still amazingly primitive. Look at women's rights in the 60s. And, uh, uh, you know, Roe v. Wade was so new. Um, no, Roe v. Wade was 1973. It was the next decade. Okay. So it, it, it's like, and this is something that always amazes me about my kids who were born in the 90s. They have no idea the uphill battle that young people like all of us here, we gray hairs, um, except for Effie, who has no gray hair at all. <laughs> uh, what we went through crusading for what seemed to be the right thing to do, not because you were progressive or liberal or Jewish or not, or black or white. It was just the right thing to do based upon our common heritage and our belief that the American constitution was, uh, we took it at its words, the Declaration of Independence and the constitution. We, we were too naive in the sixties to believe that the founding fathers were slaveholders, even though it was known. You know, we were too naive to, to think about uh, a Negro was three fifths of a man and women were not considered to vote. I mean, it was nascent, the, the, the upheaval in our youth in the 60s, where all these things began to rise into our consciousnesses. But it was a very backward time. And that's what this film's looking at. And I, I don't want to cut to the chase at the end very much, but it, it does relate to the difference between Martin saying, I can't forgive you, and uh, Philomena saying, I forgive you. But forget I said that, we'll jump to that at the end. I'm sure somebody else has something to say yeah. at this point. Um, I think that uh, Fern. the Reiner, I'm gonna say something and then the Reiners um, and uh, LaDonna after that. Um, so I just wanted to say, I think it is political as well. And um, I think that what you had was a reporter who like all men who ran our culture, our media, our institutions found that the way that the things that interest women and the way that women uh, see the world was of very little interest. It was the page two, three, four, or, or a different you know, newspaper entirely. Human interest. Human interest was considered less than, not as interesting as the war or the economy. And I think that's a highly political. Right. Eventually, mm -hmm. he becomes a much more evolved human being. And that evolved human being is because he becomes a more human person. And I think that was intentional. And I think it's political. And I okay. think that the statement that the personal is political and political is personal okay. relates to that. A absolutely. And I, I made a note when I watched it again, when he becomes a believer in her. He got looped in, and this is jumping ahead deep into the film, when he realizes there's an obstacle that the nuns are, are stonewalling them. And so you see, he took it personally, or he took in personally that he couldn't be a journalist because they were preventing him. And he couldn't uh, uh, deny that the, the, uh, the glove had been thrown at him. The challenge was made. On principle, he's not going to allow this deception to continue. So he got looped in because of deep-seated feelings of his own sense of himself, his own sense of truth. And suddenly, it's not that he was an atheist and she was a Catholic believer and a sweet woman who never had a bad word for anybody. Those binary divisions no longer existed, even though he's coming to it from a binary point of view, he's suddenly seeing her as a fellow uh, seeker of the truth, regardless of, of her religious beliefs or her political beliefs. So uh, sure, it's, it's political, but it, the, 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 there's no governmental uh, you know, assignment of guilt here. It's, 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 it's really about their story and their story against the nuns. I think so you could say you that is it, political. Jim. I think you miss it, Jim, to dismiss no, it as No, political. I never miss anything. 
What? <laughs> I don't think that something is political simply because it involves the government. It is. It no. is. It is an overarching way of how the world is ruled, and the world has been ruled from a male okay. vantage. And I think that this okay. director moved us ultimately to a very um, to appreciating a very different way of looking at the world. It's definitely a personal transformation, but I think it speaks yes. to a much bigger thing than, than just the personal. It, but it absolutely does. And that's why the film resonates with us. I, I have a confession to make that until I got to college, I was, I didn't know it, but I was kind of conservative and selfish and capitalistic and pro-individual and damn the others, you know, until I realized uh, that, wait a second, you know, there are people being damaged by our indifference. Um, I was also uh, quite an agnostic, uh, as an atheist, but uh, I was quite a, Judaism had no appeal for me um, then. And I, I think what draws Martin into it is the same thing, that, that it wasn't the politics, it was the human compassion, the sense of I feel someone else's suffering. So... And this is a political thing. I, I agree, Fern, that our, our, our social uh, uh, lack of empathy for those who are suffering and less fortunate than most of us uh, is political and, and, and that we're paying for that to this day. Uh, so look, look, I'm not naive now, but um, I was once. And But what drew me into this, this, this realm of what's the damage to other people? What are they feeling? This empathy for people I don't know was I just read the signs that were in the culture and, and met people who were hurt. I, you know, college classmates went to jail because they protested the Vietnam War. A and it's like, oh my God, this is the real thing. And slowly I became of age because I saw my world becoming of age. And I began to believe in this, this, uh, this mission of empathy, you know, which is probably what drew me to film, what was, was that film is this major connection between the viewer and the screen. Frank, please mute yourself. And, and that be, belies a greater vision of society. You know, how we can share more than we think we know about each other. You know, what, what's the human connection? And it's feeling somebody else's pain, I think, first or feeling the injustice we would not allow to be perpetrated on ourselves when we see it perpetrated on someone else. So mm. I guess I'm trying to avoid your accusation. That, that <laughs> I thought it wasn't political, but that, that was always my rant in college. Art is, uh, politics is a, is, a, is a consequence of artistic sensibility, not that you start out with political designs and you make art to illustrate it. I still believe that because the best art is, is totally passionate. And it just turns out to be political because it's humanistic. You know, it's, it's fully felt and people, it resonates with other people. All right. But come on, um, you've heard enough from me already I have. for two seconds. Um, I think that, <laughs> yeah. um, I think Frank and then LaDonna and then Barbara. Okay. Uh, I've had my hand up since, I guess your second and third sentence, Jim. Uh, when opening. And so I have three things stored up. <laughs> when your first comment was that you asked, uh, what did we uh, you know, feel about the characters, et cetera, and you wanted a global uh, approach rather than details. I, I, I answered that saying that I was left as a blank and I'm usually not speechless <laughs> at these sessions, but I was, and I think it was because it seemed to me that the movie was simple in design. It was straightforward. What you, I, I thought what you see is what you get. There wasn't any seeing the characters one way or another way or uh, changing or whatever. And I'll go into the, uh, my third question is about your, your, your observation of Martin. But that was my first thought that this is just a straightforward thing. It doesn't have as many innuendous people aren't gonna see this different ways and get different meanings out of it, et cetera. It isn't as complex as many of the movies we've discussed. That was what I had my hand up about originally. In the further discussion that we've had, um, 
you've you've mentioned about we've dwelt on on whether it's political or not. I think the obvious thing in politics is against the Catholic Church, particularly today. And since we've gone through all the uh, the scandals of the uh, uh, the pedophiles in, in, among the clergy, et cetera, and all the it, which has led to an awful lot more on other subjects of criticism of the church. How can you come away with it? Now? And one of the main thing is uh, of um, uh, the female lead, a fili- what is her name? <laughs> Philomena. Philomena comes away and still has no adverse feelings about this church and is right. as devout as ever. Uh, although those very devout people did what they did to her. I think that's amazing. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, if you ask the uh, church uh, officials what they feel about this movie, uh, you know, you, you find out that uh, they view it as political. So that that was my comment on, on the on the political aspect. Um, the third thing uh, that uh, came up in the discussion is Martin and his change in becoming more humanistic. You know, I didn't really see that as much. I thought he, he had those qualities all along. And Jim, you particularly said, you said, well, you know, he said something and you, you quoted a, a particular time where it showed that he was being won over or whatever, or changing in his perspective. Would you discuss that a little bit more? Because I kind of, you know, they, their, their relationship grew as any two people on a mission. He was, they were, Two things are motivating them is actually money to sell a story. Uh, and that may have changed along the way, but he also uh, uh, obviously spending all that time got to appreciate her as a person and, and, her, uh, and her, her, her simple but rich ways. Uh, but I didn't see it as dramatically or significantly as you did. And, and that bothers uh, uh, me. I wonder how you saw that. Okay. Uh, it's more subtle with Martin. Remember, he, he, very early he says, I was dismissed for something I didn't say, but everybody thought I said. It was a political dismissal where the, the government and power chose not to be connected with him anymore. He felt betrayed. He felt like he had sold his soul to the devil. And he was wounded, just like Philomena was wounded for 50 years. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. So, so the, he's a damaged person as well. Not as emotionally damaged, his pride is damaged, his professional identity is damaged. Um, You know, he had it lucky, you know, he still gets to rent a BMW instead of driving in a Vauxhall, you know, to the Irish uh, convent. (laughs) So, no, really, uh, the the social differences are very significant in this movie. He's clearly upper middle class, sophisticated Londoner, and she's this common woman who reads romance novels. Yet, how can these two unlike people come together at the end, still having their differences, but still having this profound appreciation for each other? Um, it's a question we should continue through this, this uh, discussion tonight. But uh, it's part of the beauty of this film is that this natural relationship evolves from opposites. And there's a big lesson there. Um, and and I, I'd like to you know, pursue what is fundamental to each of them that they share. I, I think that's the key to the movie. Um, who else, Fern? All right, so we have in the following order, LaDonna, then Barbara, then Effie. LaDonna? Yeah, I agree with Mr. Ruxton, Jim. And I like what you said, Fern, about it being political, but the correlating relationship with uh, Philomena, played by Judy Dench, and this reporter who's on the phone with the editor all the time, and then he's going to the cemetery and he's looking at these grave plots of these children that have passed and he realized the crookedness of the church and what her plight is and this poor woman, I understand, I see the beautiful relationship that is developing, but I also think it's political and you know, the, the AIDS thing and he's gay and you find out who he is and that he's gay and he worked for the president. And, oh my God, it's an amazing film. Thank you, Mr. Ruxton, for showing me. Okay, well, well, we'll come back to you later, but you're so right about that. Uh, Frank, I want to go back to, to what you said. Why, um, um, about Martin. So he's yeah, this he, wounded, wounded person. 
And um, he, he has his own ax to grind. He needs to heal himself, just like Philomena's search for her son is to try and heal her guilt for allowing the nuns to take this charming, beautiful baby boy away from her. And um, that, that is uh, something he doesn't realize. Uh, maybe not throughout the whole piece, but um, he, he's quite the cynic himself. And why does he pursue her? Yes, it's, he, you know, his wife tells him, you remember, oh, just take any job, just get busy. That's what you need to do, quit pitying yourself. And the first human interest story is beneath him. And then Philomena's daughter introduces him when she gives him a, a glass of white wine at the, the, the fancy party to this story that, you know, it's just a job for him in the beginning. And I think that's very telling. And that's what can surprise us about life is that we find connection where we didn't think it was possible before. And he's still in that, uh, oh, it's just a job. And, you know, he's trying to sell Sally, his editor on, you know, will you take the story? Will you give me a job to write it? Will you pay for the expenses? And he's selling, selling, selling Sally just because he wants a job. And then suddenly when his own journalistic skills are threatened, when somebody puts an obstacle in front of him, then suddenly he's hooked. Now, uh, Stanley Davids, whom some of you may know well, says there's no such thing as altruism, um, but whatever causes positive action is okay. And so we don't blame, we don't blame Martin for um, reacting. His own sense of truth causes him to react and engage with her and be her defender. That, that's where I was headed with that, Frank. Okay, Barbara. I, I thought what the film did amazingly, exquisitely, is that they kept they kept changing and crossing each other and moving in and out of each other. And I think they changed intensely. At the end of the film, he buys a Catholic symbol to honor her feelings, and she honors the experience by saying, "Go and expose them." And they they kept moving in and out of these different uh, understandings of each other through the whole film, and they both changed intensely. Yeah. Um, from each other, from the experience of their journey. I also thought it was political and I thought it was an incredible indictment of the Catholic church. And I don't understand anything Jewish about it, Jim. I didn't okay, get anything. We'll, we'll get to, I promise you a payoff, <laughs> right? <laughs> Including Kol <Nidman>. Um <laughs> But uh, I think you're, you're very smart to point out that they crossed each other's paths because several times in the movie, he, she says, um, uh, I don't want to go on. And he says, yeah, you should go on. And then she says, yes, I'll go on. And then he says, no, we don't have to go on. She said, yes, I must go on. It's, it's like these are still humans with changing feelings and changing their mind all the time as things grow on them, as they allow their own emotions to percolate into their decisions about how to move forward. It's beautiful. It's a really cool part of the film. And I don't know any other film where we've had that crisscrossing, like you said, um, demonstrated so palpably and on the surface as it was there. Effie. Two, two comments. One, um, at the Bible class this, today, you said, I won't tell you about the surprising ending. So I thought it would turn out that Martin was a son. So was <laughs> That's Hollywood. No, this, this is a British film. It's drier than that. So I was watching the whole film until I finally realized, no, that's not it. <laughs> But uh, the thing is that she, uh, Palomina, Philomena, um, was with her child. So the child must have been four or more. Three. He was, she was, he was three. Three. Uh, 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 and so she grew, grew very attached to him, even though she only saw him once a day. And then she, it was ripped away. Most people who give up their child for adoption they never get close enough to have the closeness and the, the feelings right. that uh, she had towards her son. Well, this is the irony of the cap of, of that particular Abby's uh, policies, you know, well, let's let the mothers have an hour a day. It's like, it's an insult, <laughs> but um, you know, I don't want to say it's, it's to their credit that they allowed an hour a day. It's just mean. Um, and uh, I think you can become attached. Remember, she was like, <clears throat> I don't know if she was the 14-year-old, but there were many others who were 
people that young. Yeah. Um, and uh, what else are you going to cling to? You're separated from your family. Philomena says, my father gave me up. He was so angry with me. He refused to have anything to do with me. So the sisters became her family. The fellow young ladies there became her siblings. They were all in this plight together, the girls. And um, look at this few scenes when uh, the sister Claire, I think, it, no, not Claire, the one in the white uh, habit, gives her the photograph. I took this picture clandestinely because I knew you'd want to have it. That sister is seeing the joy of motherhood on her face and celebrating the love that Philomena has for her baby boy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's, it's not entirely negative, but it's a condemnation that the church could even condemn its own followers to participate in such a, a plot or a policy. Um, it's rich. It's, it's rich with that. And not all the nuns are bad. Um, it's just the, the later ones, the younger ones, the modern ones are the ones who go along with the policy. And that's what's so disheartening. Not that all of them do today um, or that all adoptions are this way. Um, but remember, this is 50 years ago and adoption was a much uh, more clinical, less user-friendly process. I did adoptions 50 years, 40 years ago. I can speak to the nuns and they were horrible. You, you want to elaborate on that? Cindy? Yeah, I worked in the 70s. I worked at L.A. County in adoptions and I was the liaison to St. Anne's Maternity Home. Now, placing a child for adoption was free choice. Some of the girls decided to parent, um, but the nuns were very judgmental because when I would go for the after, most of the girls placed the babies right from the hospital. The nuns would not allow them to see the baby because they decided it would be better for her no matter what. That's illegal because the birth mother has the right in the hospital to do what she wants. The nuns, when I would go for the after placement talks with the girls, the nuns would say things like when they were in labor, oh, you should have thought of that nine months ago, or mm -hmm. God is punishing oh God. you for having sex. The, mm -hmm. I was just shocked at how the nuns treated them. And what's happening now in the 70s, probably 95% of the adoptions were closed adoptions, but now with all the DNA, yeah. with you know Ancestry and 23andMe, that members of closed adoptions are now finding each other. Right, right. Mm. So uh, how did this make you feel, uh, Cindy, if I can ask about the Catholic Church or did Horrible. you generalize it to? I mean, yeah, because the girls that went to a regular hospital and could have a parent or a friend there, they would be supportive and caring. Um, and I was just very surprised because in my mind, I had thought nuns would have been compassionate and nice, but most of them were very judgmental, upset with the girls for having premarital sex. And the girls that were here in the maternity home were the ones whose families were ashamed of them. So they, in, in essence, were hiding them during the pregnancy by sending them to the maternity home and they couldn't come back home until they placed the baby for adoption. Wow. Wow. And now it's completely different. You know, um, of course. I worked at Vista Del Mar for 30 years and they did open adoptions. The adoptive family would usually be with the birth mother. Um, the birth mother could have the child with her if she chose in the hospital or she could give it to the birth parents to be with at the hospital. Full information, contact afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, in the 70s, a birth mother would be given very general, non-identifying information about the adoptive family. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you for that. Steve Greenberg, unmute yourself. Hi, thanks. Um, I, uh, first of all, the first few scenes I watched in this movie, I thought it was going to be one of those understated British comedies. It was really <laughs> funny, uh, particularly with Coogan uh, muttering about writing that British, that Russian novel or a book about Russian history. He was right that he really didn't want to write. Um, and I think it was miraculous the way they wove this humor throughout the whole film uh, as a antidote or to leaven the uh, tragedy and the drama in it. 
Uh, even at the very end, she as they're driving away, she's offering to loan him another one of those awful romance novels. And he <laughs> says, well, why don't you just tell me about it? And she proceeds to, and the last line is, I never would have seen that coming in a million years again. <laughs> <laughs> but Steve, Steve Coogan. Tell, tell me, um, what do you think the effect was? Because I totally agree with you that the levity was throughout the movie, but it didn't undermine the seriousness of his purpose. How is that possible? Well, well what do you think? How did that work? It's very great screenwriting because it's a very delicate balance, especially mm -hmm. with something this serious and this dramatic and this moving and tragic in many ways. Um, and Steve Coogan and uh, Jim Pope, I think the co-writer's name, yes. wrote, the, wrote the screenplay as well. And they won uh, an award at the Venice Film Festival for it that year. Um, uh, parenthetically, uh, I saw Steve Coogan play Stan Laurel in a movie called Stan and Ollie. And if you want to see all the great performance and a great movie about these two uh, famous comedians uh, and some of what Coogan does in imitating Stan Laurel's routines with Hardy are just unbelievable that he could recreate that. Uh, so I became a big fan of his watching that movie. And um, I was fascinated. I loved Martin's character uh, because he has a different religion. Uh, he's not a Catholic anymore. He's a journalist. He believes in telling the truth. And when you say that he was cynical, all I hear is he's a truth teller. He's a realist. And this is as serious as a religion to him. He doesn't want to get involved with a human interest story because it isn't important enough. It doesn't affect many people's, many people's lives enough for him. But once, as you say, he got stonewalled and blocked by them. And he took this as a professional challenge. And then he started getting into it. He saw the injustice and the truth that needed to be revealed. And he's just as much uh, as passionate and religious about that as Woodward and Bernstein. Right. Uh, so uh, I, I think he was a terrific character throughout. And they did an incredible, even more incredible job because Judy Gench's character was a, a feather brain at times. Uh, <laughs> she was so consumed with, uh, no pun intended, with the buffets and, and the food and whether it was free or not. And a little moments like when um, someone offers her a drink in the airplane, and uh, she declines, and then this, the flight attendant moves on and Coogan says, but it's free. <laughs> she says, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and she asks for the drink after all, um, as long as it's free. Uh, like that old great uh, line Woody Allen quoted, uh, the food's terrible and it's such small portions too. So um, I was just, it, it was a, a real balancing act to do that kind of interweaving of humor and knowing just how much to step on the gas and ease off and step on the brake and, and go back and forth between right. them. And mm -hmm. that's a very, very difficult uh, thing to do. Uh, I forget which film it was but we saw something else where uh it reminded me a lot of films i saw in the 70s and 80s which were uh social satires uh all the way through and then four fifths of the way through the movie they suddenly wanted you to take the characters being very real and very believable and very um simple. shampoo and it, it never works uh yeah it, it just they drop the ball when they do that because they've been uh posing fictional characters dramatized dramatized characters all the way and it suddenly doesn't work when you want us to take them as real people at the end right. so Steve I don't think that um that the comments were just funny I think that they were class differences he was sophisticated and she was very unsophisticated and when she said oh look it's free it wasn't simply that she was simple. She just was inexperienced that she could actually go to a nice place and they would give her something for free. That wasn't what her life looked like. Uh, I'm not There's criticizing. I mean, no, no. I, I, you're both right. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. Who's next? You are. I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I want to talk about this, the use of humor throughout. In, in a way, it made Martin very consistent as a personality. Yet, as he bended towards her and towards the outrage that she couldn't even feel herself, it still made us feel like he was being true to himself. He didn't drop his sense of humor. He didn't become a crusader. I mean, he did become a crusader, but he was still who he was. And, and it's like this touchstone for him is this sarcastic uh, overview. 
that he has of everything, the cynicism. And uh, it was just true to his character, yet it served the plot well because it, it lightened us up, yet it, he kept coming back even stronger and more dedicated to finding the truth uh, about this. And uh, it, it's just a remarkable piece of screenwriting, Steve. I totally agree um, to accomplish that. I think Rosalind and then Carol has something to say. No, Barbara. Barbara, sorry. Yeah, Carol's on, off to the side. <laughs> okay, Roz? Oh, yeah. Barbara. I, I wanted to say one of the um, best parts of the movie for me was when they were doing Foot in the Door, which I'd never heard of before. Uh huh. And uh, Martin puts his foot in, and the lover, you know, slams the door on him. And then, then Philomena takes her purse on her arm and trudges forward, knocks on the door and gets in and gets all the information and makes the relationship work. Mm -hmm. And that to me was very telling of her determination. Right. She may have been a, a flyweight intellectually, but she was determined. And, she, and uh, she knew what she wanted and knew how to get it. And she was going to violate any social norm uh, to do it, including uh, overlook the rejection that Martin had at the door. And uh, in a way, she knew that he'll talk to me because he had to, or at least she knew she had to try. Uh -huh. So that that was a great moment. I, I totally agree. And then his reaction. Um, I, I Maybe this is a, a good point to bring this up. Did Hold anybody? On, if you're going to segue, I think Barbara had a comment on okay, that. Okay, Barbara. I think that the juxtaposition between them in terms of strength, weakness, uh, nuance, not nuance. She was very, very strong, but she was nuancely strong. And mm -hmm. she they had huge differences between them. And they kept showing the differences by juxtaposing who they both were in terms of class, in terms of experience, in terms of how they dealt with situations. And I thought it was brilliant the way they juxtaposed each other. And it made that their characters flesh out more for me. They were much deeper, richer because of that. She kept changing from being this very naive person to someone quite strong and, and quite clear. And he also changed and fluttered back and yeah. forth. And yeah. I thought it was brilliantly done. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out because she too, like his sense of humor didn't abide, but it didn't undermine his personality. Likewise, her uh, naive, unsophisticated uh, self that she brought to this scene, all the scenes, didn't undermine her sincerity or our empathy for her. So it, it, it kept both of them fresh and alive and, and true to themselves. So it, it, it was not, a, it didn't get in the way at all. If anything, it was about, uh, it made their coming together at the end more satisfying. Uh, when she says, no, I want you to tell the story. You know, that's the crisscrosses that you had mentioned before. You know, I don't want to tell it, it's between you and him. And she says, no, you should tell it. Other people should know what happened. Um, it just, it's so rich, you know, when you take these films apart, you realize how carefully constructed they were and how much sensitivity went into creating them. Um, it's hard work. It didn't hit everybody in a lightning bolt and they got it down on the page in one draft. But it, it, now there, there was a, a book that Six Smith wrote that they had to go on. So I think the roadmap for the relationship was there in the book. Not that I, I've read the book, but um, it's just a, a great combination of people and, and story that, uh, you know, made it uh, ring true to all of us. Um, Frank, you're muted. I'm mute. Uh, I would like to make a comment. Obviously, the nuns in this story were horrendous, terrible, uh, uncaring, uh, everything, every other adjective that's been used. But uh, Frank and I have, really Frank, had the experience of working in a Catholic hospital for quite a long time. And uh, the, this particular hospital was in Chicago, and they did not have an OB unit. So we dealt with uh, or learned to live and deal a lot at all kinds of events that they had with nuns that were very caring, were very thinking, and were not at all like this. So I just want to make sure that we don't take a, a, right, an you. overview of something that isn't necessary that doesn't necessarily have to have an overview. It's like putting 
Jews in no, one no, box. No. Right, right. You, you, can't, you, you can't mistake a part for the whole because right. human beings are more complicated than that. There was a sympathetic nun who gave her the photograph of the boy. Yeah. You know, who was a fully realized human being who got the mother's love. She totally understood Philomena's feelings in that moment. You know, and, and now that's what a religious person should do. <laughs> you know, it's not doctrine, it's empathy that should drive the connection between people. Um, anybody else? Come on, no. the swimmers have nothing to say about this movie. <laughs> you can come back in later. Oh, Howard has something to say. I, I think I might have an idea of, 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 of why one would, well, I don't know why, what it has to do with reform Judaism, but where, where, how this movie has something to do with has a very strong or a strong religious theme. And that is uh, that um, Martin, the journalist is, it, is very clear. He thinks of himself as being very high compared and she's very low, she's very beneath him. She's lower class, she's unsophisticated. But it all, the movie in a number of places asks the question and brings up the idea that Martin really isn't doing so well and that she's actually in a very good place despite what the blows that life has dealt her and that because she believes in God uh, and, 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 uh, and various other things that she's actually better off than, uh, than he is and, and it raises some, that question. Uh, yeah, I think he's haunted by his self-doubts and his sense of recent failure, that the world has rejected him. And she's just this modest woman who has this injury, and she's, she's on her own mission, and nothing can deter her from that. Remember, she leaves confession in the church they find by the side of the road, and she's a changed woman. No, we got to go forward with this. You know, I mean, he, he definitely changes toward in that direction. He has some, yeah. The movie portrays him as having some... Inkling of, of the truth of that, and I think buying a little tacky statue of a of a saint to give to her as a gift. So he and then she puts it on the grave. You know that's something he wouldn't. It's, it's have decency. Done. You, you know, it's when you can give up your own beliefs and honor somebody else's because well, it'll he, be meaningful to them. He's, Remember, he just created a whole scene in the abbey in the convent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it's summarily thrown out. You know, and he says, don't worry, I've calmed down now. He, he knows what he did. He seems but it's a great thing. It wouldn't be a movie without it because he un, un, unveils Sister Hildegard who unleashes the, the, the most venomous, you know, lines in the whole movie with total unforgiveness, you know. But I and, think he comes to a position of recognizing the validity of her, her point of view. Yes, right. In the, half of the beginning. Right, even though he doesn't share it. No, he, he Jesus doesn't believe in God. Never, right. No, but but he knows that she does, and he wants to do something good for her. So, isn't this? Uh, he's he's some, he's uh, reducing the importance of his own ego. It's not about his feelings; it's about hers. Don't you think yeah. it's also very Catholic, though? I mean, very Christian that it really ultimately is a film that exalts the power of forgiveness even yes. in the face of un of that which is unforgivable. I mean, they they should not have been forgiven from my point of view. But she's, her worldview. Natalie, did you want to talk about that a little? Well, you know, <laughs> I agree 100%. I was waiting because um, Jim always likes us to wait uh, uh, when you're talking about something in the end of the film. The film was wonderful on many different levels. I have several things to say, uh, but the most important thing is what Fern uh, started. To me, this film was about forgiveness and, and uh, what was his name, Martin. I don't agree with what I think um, Howard said before. Um, or somebody else. Martin never changes his feelings about forgiveness. At the end of the film, he screams out, 
I don't forgive you. Do you remember that at the end? Yes, he says, I don't. I mean, this whole thing about religion and God and, and so on. There are certain things that are unconscionable. There are certain things that are so horrible, like the Holocaust. Should we forgive the Holocaust to make us feel better? Is that a Jewish, if you're talking about Jewish, in the Catholic religion, possibly, she was so taken in by this thing that if you forgive, it makes you feel better. If you forgive, you are a good person. But from the way the film opened up with how terrible those nuns were to her and the working, you know, in the laundry, in, in telling her how evil she was and terrible and the devil was in her and their attitude towards sex was so awful. To me, for what like Fern started to say, for her to forgive them all at, in that church, that was unbelievable to me. And uh, what, they, what I think they were trying to say is that for Philomena, this is what she was brainwashed in the Catholic church that if you forgive, you will feel better. If you forgive, you're a good person. But none of those nurses, the horrible ones, deserve to be forgiven. And I don't forgive. I don't. I wouldn't forgive. So that's my point of view. And um, it was I a. Agree with you. Who said that? Lady Madonna. You agree? Are you agree with forgiveness? I, I agree with you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, anyhow, um, I was sitting and listening to all these other things. There were several other things. First of all, you have to remember that Martin wanted this job. He wanted to make a living from this. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not about a job for him midway through the film. That, that was what, but it was very important to him. Well, and, it's his own redemption, isn't it? That, that, that uh, well, he, no, he he needed to get the money for it. Yeah. That was going to be a not about article. the money. I, I I have to disagree with that. It's not okay. about the money. It's about seeking the truth. You see, it, it penetrated his core as a journalist. Oh, I can even engage in a human interest story because it's the same kind of truth I was trying to pursue as a hardcore political journalist. That's why I was in the room with Reagan and and uh, uh, Michael. Yes, uh, it's like this is who he was and, and how he came to it. And uh, it, I don't see it that way, sorry. What, I you think he was still, a, he, he just did it for the money? He was so devoted did, to her and put up with it? He did it for his own self. Okay. And well, as this goes he got back along to, in the story, then okay. it became the most amazing thing that her son was the legal counsel to Reagan and to Bush. <laughs> right. He all of a sudden had no respect for this Philomena. My God, look at this brilliant. He must no, have been brilliant. I, I, I think he respected her before that. I think um, when, when he had... learned when he okay. learned that the nuns had been deceiving both the son and the mother and telling them they couldn't put them together, that's what made his blood boil. I think and Reese would like to weigh in on this. All Reese, right, yeah? somebody else, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I want to weigh in a little bit on this forgiveness because I think you're going that way with the Judaism. Yeah. Um, I don't think uh, she forgave the nuns because she's been trained to forgive. But remember, when she went to confession, she did not confess. She That's did right. not confess her sin. And she could not take from that priest or whatever he was, yeah. a minister, could mm -hmm. not, could not take forgiveness for herself because she still believed right up to the last minute that it was her sin and mm -hmm. she never forgave herself and uh and wouldn't allow him to forgive her because she ran out crying before he even got the story i was Did, waiting for her to tell the priest off uh, oh no no D didn't she <laughs> say that it was too wonderful to be a sin and that this is the the disconnect between the church and the humanity of, of most people. But remember uh, the part uh, where she says, I loved it so much? Yeah. 
Remember? I loved what so, so much? She didn't the think sex. it was a sin then. The oh, she loved the sex. Yeah. She loved the sex. She admits that she loved the sex, but she never forgives herself for the sin. Yeah. And I think it's I oh, think I it's see. important. No, I, I, okay. I, know. I, I, I would like to I would want to weigh in on the a little further on the forgiveness. Natalie, can you mute yourself? It's got an echo. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't need you. Sorry. There we go. Um, I think that forgiveness has different ways of looking at it. On the one hand, um, there's this kind of blanket forgiveness that that one is taught if you're um, a Christian that you need to forgive. On the other hand, there is a value. Um, and so I guess I'm a lawyer because I'm arguing the other side of what I just said. But <laughs> I think that um, the, the value of forgiveness is not to the person who you are forgiving. The value of forgiveness is often to free oneself from, from renting your head space mm -hmm. out, right. and your heart right. space mm -hmm. out to a subject that need not inhabit you and damage you, not the other person. So there is a value oh, to forgive. Thank you, Fern. Thank you, Fern. don't deserve to be forgiven. Yeah. And the yeah. value is to oneself. Yeah, there's an exchange at the end where she says, you have no idea how hard it was for me to forgive the nuns, but I can't stand hate. And uh, I've mentioned this before that mediators and negotiators for you know, um, are all about finding uh, the humanity in, across the table. Judy, uh, somebody, please mute Judy, yourself. Judy, you know, I, I wanted to say something about this. Um, when they're driving up to Pete's house, to Pete's gorgeous yeah. estate, she says, I could never have given him this life, which is true. And in a, or probably true, in a way, that was almost like the beginning of the forgiveness that, you know, they, they were wrong, the nuns were horrible to take him away that way, but maybe, I think she's acknowledging maybe his life was better because of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. She's beginning to see this, you know, that uh, maybe he really did achieve some kind of happiness on his own. Yeah, I mean, you know, he, he achieved professional success. He, he had love in his life. Of course, he also died of AIDS, but that might have happened anyway. He still had lots of love when he had Yeah, AIDS. so yeah. I think maybe she saw that it yeah. wasn't all bad that, that he was taking. No, of course. This is the redemption for her and yeah. what made the pursuit worthwhile for her is because she saw there was some happiness in his life. He had achieved I want, I want to ask Cindy. Cindy, do you have... Um, very much contact with the mothers who give up their children after the placement of the adoption at any point about this forgiveness of, of either of sin or for the act of giving up the child. I, uh, the last 30 years, I only worked with the families who were adopting. I worked with the birth mothers in the seventies. So that was quite a while ago. Um, but I think every birth parent places a child thinking they'll have a better life, that they're just not ready, either that they have too many other children or they're too young. But I think the concept is that you're placing your child so they will have a better life than you can provide for them at that time in your life. But Philomena kept imagining all sorts of horrible things, that he was homeless, that he was- she didn't get closure. They just took him. They, they never told her they, they were right. going to take him. They never told her about the family. They didn't feel she had the right to know. With adoptions now, the families meet each other and, you know, the birth mother can actually choose the family that's going to adopt her child. And they very often now remain in contact. Judy, I keep muting you because every time you open it, there's a huge echo. That's all. So apologize for that. I want to say just one thing about that. One of the things that she was imagining, other than he might be homeless or an alcoholic, is that he might be obese, obese because the portions <laughs> are so large. And I thought that was hysterical. <laughs> it You're was funny. hysterical. I mean, this is how she stayed true to herself, right? You know, oh and it, it it expands her our conception of who she is and what she's capable of, the extremes. Um, I, I want to pursue this issue of hatred and and forgiveness, and um, 
uh, Martin says to her after she says, I don't want to have hate in my life. He says, yes, I'm angry. And then she says, it must be exhausting. And this is how you destroy yourself with guilt and, and bad blood and, and rage and anger. And I, I'm not a Buddhist and never will be. I think it's a denial of life, but there is some wisdom into stepping back and saying, wait a second, maybe my feelings aren't the most important thing here. Frank, did you want to say something? Frank, unmute. Frank, unmute, there you go. Yeah, I am. Um, there's another um, dichotomy here or uh, strain in the story. Uh, Philomena is a very devout Catholic. She is fully indoctrinated. And, uh, you know, homosexuality is, is a sin in, the Catholic, uh, in Catholic doctrine. Yet she very willingly and even accepts that her son is gay or was gay. Uh, and there's not any doubt in her mind. In fact, the script goes on to show her in, in some almost comedic ways, her acceptance of this. Uh, there's no strain shown in that part. And that's, that's peculiar, I think. Well, she says, uh, uh, oh, I always knew he was gay. He was so sensitive. Yeah. True. <laughs> you know, so she knew before anybody else did, before even he did. But it didn't matter to her because he was her son. You know, so it, it, it's like, I, I wish that uh, the American community would feel that way about uh, gay people. Of course. You, you of know, course, but, but and, until, until it strikes close to home, I, I, so I know that's pejorative sounding, but until you know somebody who's gay and didn't realize they were, you, you don't appreciate um, the error of your, your thinking. Of course. Uh, but at age three, I thought that was, uh, but whatever. Well, anyway, maybe he was story. great with the story. You know, and, we accept, <laughs> and we May accept I... the story for what it is. But well, I, I thought that that was, that was uh, without explanation, that was kind of a... Uh, it's a mother's feeling. Uh, sure. You know, it's, of course. It's, how, who are we two guys to question that? <laughs> oh, Jim, may I ask you a question? And may I ask Bernie a question? Yes. Um, when we're talking about birth mothers, giving up your children, there's all kinds of situations that happen in life where you know what's the best for your family. If you've been through a rough time, a birth mother who's grown up on the streets and that's how dangerous it is, that's the best for it. Like Moses' mother put him in a basket, right? So I don't, I want us to all realize that birth moms do what they have to do to make sure that their children are provided for, and then what goes around comes around. They come back and wish you Happy Mother's Day, and I'm proud of you, and blah, blah, blah. I'm just, I like this film. I'm thankful that you showed it. Good. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. Um, okay. Jim, uh, let's continue. That, oh, go ahead, Brian. At a proper time, I wanted to, uh, and I'll hold off, uh, give the group a, a another uh, current movie about uh, the Catholic Church that might be of interest, but I'll wait. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I think leading to my introduction, what struck me in, in this third time that I, I saw the film this afternoon is that here is a clear case of the agnostic and the believer coming together to love each other despite their differences. It doesn't matter to him that she believes in God. It matters to him that she found some closure with this story of what happened to her son. You see, and, and that's, that's, that is so reformed Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's my fiction about what reformed Judaism is or or why I justify my attraction to what we do here and in Torah study. Uh, but it's like, despite our differences, there is a way to come together. 
you know, even on the abortion issue or the uh, creationist issue, which I will have some conversation with Stan about. Um, we have to teach each other how to find that middle ground that doesn't violate our dignity and our sense of self, yet shows a great understanding and acceptance of the other person. Now, when they're saying, you know, uh, hateful things like we the Jews will not replace us or, you know, uh, white supremacists, you know, as, as Fern and others have said, there are certain concepts that are totally out of bounds and are unacceptable to us. I'm, I'm not saying that they're, those don't exist. But in the case of these two people, we have this, uh, you know, clear development of a loving, trusting relationship. Um, uh, it's not just a buddy movie or a road trip movie. It's about a, a genuine conversion of I, I, I see this other person in ways I could never have imagined. Um, and it's a wonderful thing. Did you take that? Um, so uh, to me, I, you know, it made me think of Kol Nidre, you know, when we say, forgive me because I'm going to break all the promises I, I made in the, I did break all the promises I made last year and I'm going to do it again. It's like nothing is absolute, even my most profound promises to myself mm-hmm. and, and to uh, some sense of divinity and, and to the Jewish community. It doesn't matter, but yet, yet there's still something we have to strive for between each other. And, and uh, it doesn't even have to be within the Jewish community. Uh, it's this human strain of, God, that person's feeling is mine. I get it. I feel that in some other ways. And, and that's all we have to share. Like my friend, the, the, mod, the, uh, the mediation instructor says that until she, she uh, helped, tried to help Israeli and Palestinian uh, peace negotiators work together, and she gave up because she couldn't, because they couldn't see each other as the same human beings, mm. otherizing each other. And, and that's the issue. And that's, that's sort of what's behind all the films that are programming. By program for us is how do we come to that place of acceptance and understanding? Um, so May I ask a question? Sure. Don't you think that music and sports will have, play a big part in that? Because there are that, people today that play soccer, they would never even talk to one another to play soccer together and play people to play music they, they together. Do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a lovely documentary about uh, uh, Palestinian Arabs and Jews on the same soccer team. And they, yeah. they were the winningest team in, in, in the Middle East and pol- politics drove them apart and denied them a championship or something like that. It's a cute film, not a great documentary. And uh, uh, we saw, uh, did we see Crescendo here? We did, about the Palestinian youth and the Jewish youth in Israel trying to form an orchestra together. It's like, these are these great reasons for people to come together. Until and Rabbi, Na- get- Rabbi Nanus talked about the Orthodox, the Orthodox rabbi who got invited to Saudi Arabia to pray with the king for peace. And I said, well, I could play piano there and solve this problem. Right. But until you share something with somebody else, whether it's bread or you, Italians say you don't know someone until you shared a pound of salt with them, you know, the, the, the point is that you have to meet somebody on terms you can share. And we're not all that far apart. And, and, and this film was so wonderful in, in doing that despite their differences, which you know, seemed insignificant by the end of the film because they were both, they both succeeded in what they wanted to do uh, and surprise themselves. She never thought she'd release something so horrible. Then she realized she had to have her story told. And he thought, oh, I respect you so much. This is a very private matter. I can't blow this open. And she says, yes, please do. Um, it, it, it's, it's just constant reverberations back and forth between people. And I, I thought it was terrific. I, I saw it a couple of years ago and I said, yeah, but, you know, should I program it? And then I, I came across it in my notes and I said, wow, this is really good for us. Effie? Yes. Um, what the uh, nuns did to her when her child was born was terrible. But that was a long time ago and the church has changed somewhat, I believe. But they also did it when he came and he wanted to find his mother 
And they knew that and they knew who the mother was. And even at that much later date, it's almost yeah. as big a crime as the original crime, not quite, but they didn't put the mother and the son together when they could have. Right. Before right. he died. Right. And, and I think uh, he published his book in 2009 and the film was made in 2012 or 13. So uh, yeah, things change very slowly. You know, it's a spiral. We make limited progress with every, you know, turn of the, the wheel and uh, history repeats itself. Jim, I would uh, like to comment on your notion that it, it's, you know, Jewish in its value. I think as much as I would like to take credit for all good things um, <laughs> being Jewish, I think that all religions, certainly the major religions and uh, do or at least attempt to do you know, good things in the world. And while you can say that it's not, uh, it doesn't run counter to Jewish values, I think they're generally, any religion could claim that they try and get people to, um, they try and get people to, to acknowledge yeah. different points of view, to love each other, to forgive each other. These are all values that, that all religions espouse and um, you know they, they espouse, they claim. Yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, achieving is different, and and we've seen in it's so hard. many religions the fractured sensibilities among the adherents. People tend to extract from religion their own agendas and to see the religion fulfilling their point of view. Um, I can't speak for others. Um, I, I just find these resonances uh, meaningful for me, and I, I hope they are for you um, and, and everybody else. Uh, I try and make these connections. Um, I didn't realize it was about agnostics and believers, but the, the, this theme is, is very much there. And it affects us as Jews. We, uh, there was this rabbi in NPR once who said, oh, many in my congregation are atheists. They're the best kind of Jews. You know? <laughs> and it, it's like, so what is it all about? Is it, you know, uh, love of the doctrine, a blind uh, obedience, obeisance to uh, the tradition? Or is it, how do I make this meaningful to me? So, you know, you know, I, I went from other religions. I think um, Jay and, yes. and Steve Greenberg. I, I have a little different take on it. I think this movie that they were trying to get across is the concept of society has looked to institutions to provide well-being and happiness to people. And, and what happens when institutions fail? This movie is about failed institutions. The Catholic Church is a failed institution in this movie, as is the political class that Martin belonged to. They failed him. So, they're so Philomena and, and Martin are both looking for some sense of, of how do you survive failure when you're in the institutions that you rely on fail you. And, right. Great point. And, and what this movie really shows, I think, what, what they're trying to show is the resilience of people. People can, can survive failure when they have enough strength of personality and well-being to do it. And, and both these people had that. She has it in a, in a uh, uh, lower middle class way. And he has it in an upper uh, intelligentsia uh, uh, class way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, good observations. Steve, uh, I also, I also, I'm, not, I'm not following Jim, how it has to do with either Jewish or reform Jewish. I don't think reform Jewish owns any particular part of um, kindness any more than, I mean, Kol Nidre we is- don't, We don't, we don't, we, we, we don't. I don't. I don't quite understand what the, what the Jewish parallel okay. is that you're talking about. Well, it may be more a political parallel, but uh, you know, there's this notion of uh, Isaac struggling with the angel and how it's uh, waved as almost a banner for reform Judaism, that it's not about belief, it's about engagement and the struggle uh, with tradition, with the culture, uh, with the Torah. And um, that always appealed to me because, you know, as somebody who's still struggling and, and or <laughs> may have quit struggling, but doesn't accept much of the, uh, the literalism of the Torah, 
um, uh, that um, Judaism seems to allow for more of that kind of dissent and independent thought. Um, for me, you know, my approach to movies is how did it make you feel? How did you react? Is to revert to the human instrument, which will put us in closest touch with ourselves. And I won't say that's divine, but I'm saying that's the, the, the best way to be true and, and to make sense of our world is to use ourselves as the instrument for our examination. That doesn't mean that we're always right, but that's the starting point for investigations. And Howard has something to say? Oh, Steve Greenberg first and then oh, Howard. Then. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to say uh, or mention two other remarkable moments in this that um, are related. Uh, one was maybe two thirds or three quarters of the way towards the end of the film that um, uh, Philomena is beginning to lose hope and they're in a bar somewhere and Martin shows her the bottle of lager or ale or I don't drink, so I don't know what it was. Yeah. And he says, what is this? Yeah. And she sees a symbol on it and she says it's a Celtic harp. And then he refers back to the picture of her son with Reagan in the Oval Office. And he shows her a symbol, something on his jacket. Same. He says, what's yeah. this? And she says, it's a Celtic harp, uh, which I guess is a, some Irish patriotic nationalistic symbol. And um, he says he was he went home. That's why he went back to Ireland. He was going mm -hmm. home. When they get over there, um, and uh, they see the graveyard. She, he then says to her, he knew that you would find him here. He knew he was dying and he wanted to, you to find, be able to find him. So that's why he came back. He wasn't just going home to Ireland because he didn't remember it being three years old when he left. But he really wanted her to be able to find him. And he wanted to find her as much as she wanted to find him. Well, it's like, it, it's like Jews going back to Poland or Russia or Hungary to see where their grandparents and great-grandparents are buried or, or lived before they emigrated. It's some sense of your own source. Um, and, and that was her turning point. You know, her big worry was, will he remember, does he remember anything of me or of Ireland? And there's, here's this proof that he, he did very much. So it was a big hook for her. Howard. Oh, Howard. I, I would th think it might be cl it's clarifying in my mind to think that the distinction that's being made, th the connection that you're trying to make with Reform Judaism, might be better to say it with liberal religion. That is, if you talk okay. to, instead of Rabbi Stanley, if you talk to a liberal uh, Presbyterian minister, you would get the exact same. Uh, he might have. He might have an enlightened one. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's not really reformed Judaism. All right, but this is what we have. I mean, it's one of the things that brought us together as a film group. Um, and uh, you know, I, I sorry, <laughs> my apologies. No, it's not an issue of apologies. It's an issue of reframing that I think that this is something is a film that fits within our beliefs as it might fit within others as well. Okay. And Thank you. Better way of putting it. it. Much You're better. Amazing. Way. Yeah. Um, but films have a way of doing that. And, and uh, other people, both Christians and Catholics, will agree with us as well. So I um, interrupted your amazing house. Oh, You're an well. amazing house. Um, I because think I put up I, with your abuse. <laughs> it's okay. Frank um, um, had a he wanted to suggest that there was a Catholic themed film. Was was that do I remember correctly? Yes, you do. Uh, on the New York Times uh, streaming now, uh, there are 50 best movies on Netflix. And heading a list, I don't know why it, it starts with it, but the, the first film that's on the list is Procession, which was uh, filmed in 2021. And it's about... Uh, uh, the a group of men who uh, were victims uh, of uh, of these uh, uh, the priests and uh, oh. uh, uh, being uh, raped by them and their attempts to come to terms with that. 
uh, it's kind of drags in places, whatever, but it is about the Catholic Church and uh, the, the struggle between belief and, 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 and not belief uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, striving for perfection and what and, and realism, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I just bring that to your attention. Well, thank I you. I thank, thank everybody you. here because as I, as I said when I started uh, that I thought, you know, it's a simple film. It's what you see is what you get. That the they weren't the characters to me didn't seem at first that complex, but as a result of the discussion here, which is wonderful about the group, I see a, a lot more. And we as a group have uh, made me realize more that perhaps I didn't appreciate when I when I was viewing the film. And it was the second time I've seen it. We, Yvette and I, saw this uh, almost a year ago, I believe, and uh, and saw it here the second time. So I thank you all. Well, thank you, Frank. Thanks I for think it is, it is probably true that whether one likes the film or not is not necessarily the mark of whether the conversation will be good. And uh, the conversation is, is generally very good here. So that, that's something that, that, that's very fun and a tribute to you, Jim. You want to tell us about what's coming up? You have any idea yet? I, I wish I could. The holidays have done the better of okay. me. Um, uh, so I don't know. Uh, we will not be meeting on uh, next week for sure or in two weeks. So it'll be uh, probably this uh, uh, early January will be our next event. I don't know the film. Um, I'll try and mix it up a bit. I'm watching a lot of films these days. There's so many current releases that are so good the, for Academy nominations that are available online. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. I just haven't, you know, gotten the chance to prioritize them. But I wish all of you a happy new year. Do you have uh, some suggestions for films we should watch during the holidays? Not necessarily for this group? I do. I've been <laughs> seeing a lot of movies. West Side Story is to die for. Oh, Fabulous. for sure. Tick, Tick, Boom is fantastic. We watched that last week. Oh, that's right. I was I was in a tornado at the time. Um, also, um, I don't think it's been released yet, but the Spanish film Parallel Mothers is yeah, wonderful. Yeah, Almodovar. Yeah. Pardon me. Yeah, Pedro Almodovar. Pedro Almodovar. Yeah. These are all. Ter oh, and also Swan Song. All of these are really oh. special films. I saw most of them at the AFI Festival, except for West Side Story. West Side Story, <laughs> I put up on my daughter's birthday. I recorded it 30 years ago in a demo to save my husband's please, life. You mute yourself, Judy, It's so please. beautiful, so beautiful. Yeah. Um, I don't have my notepad handy because I have several notepads. Um, uh, you might, uh, if, you know, Kino Lorber, um, I don't often refer us to films there because um, you have to pay for them and, and the, there's probably no way the synagogue could do that. Uh, Test Pattern, Akasa and France. Uh, Acosta is about a family that's lived in a swamp uh, for decades and is forced to leave because the city fathers want them out. Um, How do you spell that, Jim? A-C-A-S-A. -A -A. It, it's a documentary, and I haven't seen it yet myself. Test Pattern is a racial story that's supposed to be very good. France, I forget what it is. Um, uh, 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 being the Ricardos about Lucy, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Uh, I just got a screener today, a DVD of it. Um, uh, and Nicole, I, Nicole Kidman? Yes, Nicole yeah. Kidman and, and uh, Bardem. Thank you. That comes um, out Tuesday. Yeah. On um, streaming. Oh, okay, good. Uh, yeah, I, I want to warn you off of uh, uh, Power of the Dog, which I look forward to, the new Jane Campion movie. I think it's very, um, uh, I don't think it's a good film. I, I think it's uh, too coy and none of the critics got it. Um, as rich as it is and, and the performances are great, but story-wise it's evasive. We loved it. You did? We loved well, it. I tell, tell me what it was about, Risa. It was about character development. That's what it was about. Okay, you're easier. Yeah. Than, you're easier than I am. <laughs> Belfast also is an excellent. We enjoy film. it. Uh, Belfast was not one of my, you know. Uh, Belfast and um, 
uh, the French Dispatch, which I just watched last night. It's like, it's a stunningly beautiful film and very clever and witty. And, but at the end of it, you say, so what? You know, it, it's like a great exercise. He's a great visualist. And um, like Budapest Hotel, which had more of a human story to it. Um, it's missable. I mean, there's so many other good ones to watch. Uh, Cyrano is something to watch out for uh, with uh, Peter Dinklage as Cyrano de Bergerac. So instead of a long nose, he's four and a half feet tall. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it's a musical as well. Uh, oh, Denzel skip... Washington is going to be playing uh, the Scottish play. That, uh, Macbeth. The Macbeth. I don't say yeah. that. No. That, that's worth seeing, I suppose, just because it's him. I do say Bubby and Daddy are going to be smiling when while I'm being the recorded. The mommy and mother-in-law always call me Lucy. Yeah. So it. there's lots of good stuff. Um, follow the critics. You know, Justin Chang's pretty good in the LA Times. He didn't get Power of the Dog quite right. Um, Reese, I'll take that up with you later. Uh, and, uh, um, and, but, you know, are you saying he liked it? I didn't like it either. Are you saying he liked it? Uh, he didn't see it for what oh. it was. Okay. You know, and, and there was a woman critic, I forget where, she said, oh, it's about this brutal man, you know, facing himself. And no, <laughs> no, it's, that's not what's there on the page. Joanne didn't like it either, apparently. I did not like it either, but I love the Ricardos. Uh, I, 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 can, I can say something that will ruin it for everybody who hasn't guys. seen it. I won't. I don't I'm, not, I'm, I'm a kind man. The Ricardos, look, it's, it's, it's Aaron Sorkin who did Chicago 7 and so many other great films and television shows. He's a great writer and director. I, I watch anything he's done. Um, <laughs> And uh, it even deals with uh, Lucille Ball's uh, brief affiliation with the Communist Party and how they feared that would wreck the television show. So that is a political movie. And he deals with it fairly, I hear. I haven't seen it yet. Um, there's something else, uh, Macbeth. Uh, I don't know. There, there are just so many. This is the season. The season Jim, the Jim, I'm looking forward to two movies both deal with relationships of, of uh, one kind or another. One is a foreign film called Drive My Car. Yes, Justin yes. Chang thought it was wonderful. Yes. I'm looking forward to that one. Too. The other is Come On, Come On, yeah. which, which is supposed to be quite... I, I saw Come On, Come On. And oh, really? How, how did you think of it? it? It's, it's charming. It's black and white, beautifully shot. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is terrific. Even better is The Young Boy. Yes, I am. His nephew. Terrific. But it's like, it could have been a 30 minute movie for me. I, I it, it really doesn't go anywhere other than to say, these guys had a great relationship that we all wish for an uncle uh, like Joaquin Phoenix. Um, but that's Mike Mills's movies. That's his kind of film. I forget another one you may have seen. Um, it's worth seeing because it's just so heartfelt and the boy is wonderful. So to give I you saw Drive pleasure, My Car. And right. it's, three, yeah. it's three hours long. It's very brilliantly done. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous cinematography. However, despite the fact that it is called Drive My Car, it could have been a half hour shorter by just not showing the car being driven. <laughs> okay, maybe you can drive well, that, my That's car. a sensibility that American filmmakers don't share. It's For sure. Film and it takes you, its time. But uh, so there's lots of good films. I, I'm sure we'll program some of them. By the way, uh, Netflix has more of the uh, award worthy films right. on it than uh, Amazon Prime. Right. So that's the place to look for current releases, but we'll definitely see a couple of them, regardless of whether uh, or not they get nominated. How many people are actually going to the movies? Uh, not as many as they hoped. I, I'm going to go see a fiddle on the roof. Well, uh, Joanne, what did you see? Hi. No, I, I saw, actually, I saw Belfast. I saw the Ricardos. I saw um, Power of the Dog. In the movies. Uh -huh, okay. I can't think of. <laughs> and I bet the theaters weren't packed when you went. Well, I go to, actually, I go to a private screening. So we oh, get, lucky you. We get maybe about 100 people there. Yeah. Most of the time, uh, there's six people, people in the theater. The, the big West hope. Side story where you got to mute yourself. You can't hear. Yourself. Um, the hope was that 
when we seem to be coming out of the pandemic before Omicron became so fearful mm. that people would come back more and that these big tentpole movies like West Side Story, uh, Tick, Tick, Boom, uh, were all disappointing in their box office results because people just didn't want to come to the theater. And so we're not over that, that hump yet. Um, and some of the films like Tick, Tick, Boom would have been great on a big screen, West Side Story, great on a big screen. You just have to content themselves with your big screen TV at home. Um, but turn the sound up loud, do invest in a sound bar to improve the quality. That's a big deal for those of you who haven't discovered sound bars and uh, keep watching. Um, but thank you all for a great year. This has been thank you, really Mr. gratifying for me. Thank you, um, thank I, you Jim. We had some wonderful discussions and um, to all of you too. And Bye. you'll hear from me after the new year. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year, New Year everybody. everybody. Take care. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I don't know, right away. Service show. Yeah. Let me come calling, come cannonball down from the sky. Good inside. Bright as a rose. That's <laughs>